Welcome to the Dentsu Beach House. Um, we're going to talk about fandom today, but before we start, I'm going to share some stats. Um, the video game industry is scheduled to make $312 billion by 2027. PlayStation 5, the newest, the latest, the greatest console, has soared more than the last two iterations, and there's 125 million connected consoles today out live in the world. In addition, uh, if you follow me on LinkedIn, uh, you've heard me say, uh, even when it's not about video games, it's about video games. Um, Super Mario Brothers, one of the highest grossing box office hits um, of all time. The Last of Us, one of the best viewed shows on HBO of all time. Arcane, one of the uh, adaptations from League of Legends, um, one of the greatest shows uh, from Netflix of all time. And so when you start adding these things together and you look at platforms like Roblox, um, who have 70 million daily active users. That's not monthly, that's not lifetime, that's every single day. Companies like that are paying companies like Marcus's, which we'll talk about in a second, um, almost three quarters of a billion dollars annually just to create and build on their own platforms. So while you think those are big, huge, gaudy numbers, there's this little brand called the NFL. And the NFL uh, has $18 billion in revenue alone last year. Uh, one of the teams in the NFL was recently sold for over $6 billion, purchased for much less than that, <laughs> much less than that. Um, and the most watched program of all time, the Super Bowl, uh, had 123.4 million viewers across all platforms, and that's a rise of 7% from the previous year. And if you didn't think that the NFL was innovative, this year, hot off the press last week or two weeks ago, uh, you can watch two NFL games live on Netflix on Christmas Day, um, globally. 150 countries. Hey, 150 countries. So when you start to look at these types of powerhouses, um, you wonder, man, how do they get there? How do they actually do that? And why is this group here sitting here talking about it today? Um, it's because of the fans. So um, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our panel. Um, first, uh, Ian Trebetta. You don't need to stand. You can just wave. You're Thank you. It's yeah, hot and sweaty. I'll stay seated. You stay, you. stay seated. Um, Ian leads uh, social influencer and content marketing for the NFL. Uh, Magali Huat works for us on the Dentsu Gaming team. Um, she's our global lead strategist um, for everything gaming. Uh, and Marcus Holstrom is the CEO and co-founder of the award-winning, I, I, I didn't have that in my notes, the award-winning agency, um, The Gang. So uh, first and foremost, uh, everybody, if we can just welcome our panel. So before we kind of get going, um, if you guys just want to kind of go around real quickly, I did a little intro, but um, what's been the best thing you've seen here uh, at Cannes this week? Marcus, you start. You will be, yeah. I start. Oh. Um, I personally, I've kind of been going around looking into what's happening around here and uh, meeting a lot of people just to kind of feel the temperature. And uh, it's my first time in uh, Cannes Lions. I really love it, I have to say, and I think it's so interesting to see the shift that's coming and that uh, the interest for gaming is growing as well. And um, I'm not from gaming personally. I've only been in gaming for five years approximately when I started the company. Uh, so I'm still learning myself. <laughs> and, um, and it's super fun to meet everyone. Lovely. Magali? Yeah, hi. Um, I head up to gaming strategy here for Dentsu. And... Uh, I first time at Cannes as well. My favorite thing has been just meeting like-minded people and everybody from different industries. Um, I also really loved all of the panel that we've had here, but I've also had the chance to go to a panel next door uh, where someone also from um, actually the Kansas City, um, City Chief. Yeah, Laura, the CMO. Yeah, yeah. yeah, she did a really nice talk yesterday. Uh, and I'm looking forward to get into more of the specific about the newer generation and, and gaming today. Nice. Amazing. Uh, and I'm Ian Trombetta. Uh, I oversee the social influencer creator and content marketing teams at the NFL. And, and uh, for, for me personally, it's, it's been amazing to see this convergence of sport, technology, and just the entrepreneurship of our athletes. Uh, we first started coming here several years ago you wouldn't find an, an American or you know, a football player uh, here at Cannes. 
And today uh, we're seeing Travis Kelsey, Jason Kelsey, Shannon Sharp, Andrew Whitworth. I could just go on and on with Brandon Marshall. There's so many different guys that are here because their platforms have grown so much. Um, and that, that's just terrific to see. And it's a, it's a great representation for, for our brand, not only in the US, but continually looking at the global opportunities. Um, and then probably the, the top, top highlight was seeing Diana Flores with the Olympic torch and passing that on. Yeah. Uh, flag football will be a part of the LA 28 Olympics uh, for the first time for both men and women. And that's a really transcendent moment for, for football as a whole. That's crazy. I mean, the growth of football is nuts. I was explaining, um, I went to my first NFL, well, I live in London, so I'm a little bit of a, 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 a weird one. Obviously, I grew up in the States as an American football fan. Went to an NFL match game, uh, and it wasn't two teams. It wasn't home and away. It was like a rainbow of your favorite uh, football team. It was Cardinals and 49ers and Giants and stuff. It was this almost like celebration. Yeah. Um, of, of the fandom of, of all those teams. Okay. Yeah, wow. it, you, you're spot on. I mean, it's, it's very interesting to see how football is developing in, in different markets and in very, very different ways and varied ways. Uh, our, our goal and, and our, I think our opportunity, and this is where I think gaming becomes such a huge component of what we're doing, is to maintain that engagement year round, yep. even when the games may not be on in optimal times. Uh, they might be on at two in the morning. Um, and also looking at partners that can scale globally with us. So obviously, we're working with, with Roblox quite a bit. They're, they're one. Uh, Netflix, you just mentioned, another one uh, that offer those opportunities for us to just gain more exposure and reach around the world. So we started talking about the fan and the future fan and next-gen fan. We can kind of call them, call them whatever we want. But what, what are the KPIs that you look at? And what are the labels that you're assigning to that fan? And what, like, what can brands who are like watching this? What can our clients do? Like, how can we help like extract some of that, um, some of that labeling with the next gen fan? Yeah, I th one of the key ways, and this is on on us at the league, is to continue to to educate our partners on all the different ways that they can work with us. Um, I think for for the NFL in particular, 93 of the top 100 TV shows in the United States are NFL games. Uh, so there, there's this. There's this real, I think, natural thought process as to I work with the NFL in a linear space and I buy commercials and I run through that way. And, and obviously our games deliver uh, probably better than, than any other property, uh, at least in the U.S., in, in that environment. And continually we're looking at ways in which we can diversify our platform mix and ways in which we can bring partners in. And that's not just you know gaming partners. That's also CPG partners like Procter & Gamble. Uh, that's partners like Nike so many others. So uh, in doing that, it's just going to open up more opportunities for them to also scale with us globally. Yeah, you, we, we, when we talk about scale, we talk about stickiness as well, like trying to keep people engaged. So Marcus, you build experiences for, for fans. We often call them, con it used, they used to be called consumers. Now they're called players. Now they're called fans. So that uh, uh, those terms have been changing as well. But how do you guys think about stickiness when it comes to keeping players engaged in platforms like uh, Roblox? I, mean, I think it's super important to um, think about why the players are there. Uh, what's the intent? It's, um, and when you're a brand, especially, or, um, t or uh, NFL, for example, you have to think about not being there as a PR stunt, and not doing something that is like me, 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 but more think about, okay, why are 77 million daily users actually on this platform? What did they want to do? And then um, on Roblox, it's very social. It's more of a social platform than a gaming platform, I would say. I spoke with a person yesterday, and um, he said that he had uh, moved across the world, uh, time hours, time difference, and still was, his kid was still joining uh, Roblox on the same hours as the friends. <laughs> uh, because they wanted to hang out, they wanted to socialize. Yeah. And also when we think about um, the brands and everything, we try to do it holistic. We, we try to see, okay, why is the brand wanting to be there? What do they want to get out of it? But also long term, not only short. And also, do they have partners like yeah. Procter & Gamble or similar? And yeah. how can we bring them into the same mix? Yeah, yeah. That it's the. In order to have that consistency, it's easy because with, with the NFL, because you know exactly every, you know, well now it's Thursday. Sometimes Saturday, fr Sunday, Monday. Yeah, you check the boxes of different different nights of the week. <laughs> but yeah, it's uh, 
it typically is a Sunday, Monday, Thursday, and we right. get into Saturdays, and we'll have even games on Wednesday and Christmas Day with Netflix. So, yeah, that, we're spanning the calendar. <laughs> You're spanning the calendar. So when you start talking about that, like, kind of schedule growth, like, Magli, can you talk a little bit about how what, – what we're seeing, like, there's a lot of flashes in the pan – there's a lot of press mm-hmm. releases. There's a lot of big, yeah. huge headlines. Yeah. But can you talk a little bit about like the difference between the headline grabbing and 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 uh, and, yeah. and, and more? Yeah, yeah. Um, I think well, this is one of my biggest pet peeves. I think is when I see something that's like big and flashy, but then that dies down right away. And that's something that we would absolutely advise against, right? Like especially in connected worlds, especially on gaming platforms where. The fandom is so active and leaned in. We want to make sure that you're engaging with that community over a long period of time. And I think that's something that the NFL has done very well to date and continues to do. Um, Because very well, like Marcus said, a Roblox platform, all of those connected platforms are like another social platform, right? You're gathering your community around your brand campfire and you need to keep having that conversation. Otherwise, you don't get as much of the return as you can get out of, out of that fandom. Um, but also, w- you're able to really um, understand the trends and understand how you can tap into existing behavior and be really authentic to what the use case are depending on the platform you're on to, right? That's going to be a little bit different if you're going on to, you know, um, Cut of Duty versus a Roblox versus any yeah. other platforms. Yeah. I think that's a great point just to, to build on that. Um, and I totally agree. Gaming is, is and has been much more like a social platform than something that you just pop in and out of uh, very casually. If you think about the players, many of them are spending hundreds of hours playing those video games. And so as you're thinking about it, I mean, if I think about platforms that we're active on, like a TikTok or a, an X, would you post just one time a month exactly. or every six months on those platforms? Absolutely not. Mm-hmm. And I think now this evolution of, of gaming, the work that you all are doing is, is really helpful to just change the narrative and I think the thought process around what it actually takes to be successful on a, on a powerful gaming platform. Yeah, and I always like to remind ourselves that when we think about engagement, we think about these... So amount of spend time per day on platform, right? You look at Roblox only, it's two and a half hours on average spend a day. It is 2.5x, you know, the amount of time that a user would spend on a TikTok, on Instagram. And just with that alone, then you want to understand, like, what type of conversation do I need to have with them during that amount of time? Understanding that it's longer and understanding that I have more opportunities to have more significant touch points with the community. I would like to build upon that one as well. Go, Marcus, go. I will, I will, I will. Uh, No, but also, I think the difference between uh, these platforms, the UDC platforms and uh, X, for example, is that you are focused. You are fully there when you're there. Um, On the other platforms, Instagram, you're just scrolling. Uh, You don't really focus, you're not super engaged. Yeah. And that's the major difference, I think. Yeah, this p- the like passive engagement, active engagement. I mean, technology has just changed so considerably, right? We talk about the, the, the iPhone, I think, what, just turned 13 years old, I think? Like 14? Isn't that wild? Like, that's, that's not that old. Like, that's wild. Like, in the concept of digital natives and, like, marketing plans and marketing mix for, for digital natives, I always joke around if... Uh, like I was working, you know, ten years ago with a company. It was like we need a marketing plan and we need a social media plan. We we none of us would have jobs if we ever did that today, right? Like the evolution of the marketing plan and mix has just changed. When you look at who you're actually targeting, um, this is a little bit for for Ian and, and you, Marcus. When you look at that change, uh, like obviously fans are growing older just by nature. Um, they bring us along. Like my parents force fed. Uh, like force-fed fandom in, into me. Where's Abby? Abby was force-fed Miami Hurricanes fan. Yeah. Like, oh, the you. <laughs> yeah. So when you're force-fed fandom, obviously that goes up. So naturally, you want to create a younger audience. But every, it's kind of a bullshit. There's kind of a bullshit. Like everyone wants to get younger, right? Yeah. But what does it mean to you to have an actually engaged younger audience? And how are you guys using video games to kind of do that? Yeah, so I guess in a very 
uh, simplistic way, if we think, think about it, you go back through time, and you think about the way that sports have really grown uh, across the world, uh, a, a sport like baseball was undoubtedly the, ba the radio sport, yeah. right? And I think that unquestioned, they were the radio sport that you'd gather around and listen to the baseball games. Uh, then it moved into to football becoming the dominant linear sport where you watch the games with your friends and it's a, it's a real culture moment when these games happen. And, and, and probably the same for soccer uh, worldwide. And then you think about who, who's going to be that next dominant sports league in the social and gaming space. And I, I think as we're seeing different opportunities come up to engage those younger fans, it's infusing some of the learnings that we can take from, from gaming in particular and, and through social media and, and really ensuring that they have a meaningful stake in, in the major parts of our, our activations and marketing programs. Yeah. Uh, having a stake is really interesting as it relates to gaming. Can you talk a little bit about, like, you know, because you make games yourselves and you make games on behalf of brands. So when you're looking at a game, how do you get stake? <laughs> we're calling we're calling thirteen year old stakeholders, but what is what it, like? How do you how do you get them into that buy in? And how is that different from a FIFA experience than a own, the gang owned IP? Like, what's the difference there? Um, first of all, we tried not to make too many differences because it's still a game. It should be fun. It should be entertaining. It should be super super interesting as long as they come in, and. Um, we also have a widespread of people, everyone from very, very young ones to, uh, I think 30% of Roblox is over uh, 17 plus. Yeah. And um, we have down to five years old. And when you think about it, we also have a global audience. Um, US is around 30%, 25, 30%, Europe around 30%, rest of the world the rest. So um, we can't, and most of the people can't read English. <laughs> and uh, a lot of them can't even read. Yeah. So. You have to create something that is engaging, that you understand from get-go, that kind of makes them intrigued. But then also you can bring values into it and you can uh, do things. Yeah. So I think that's usually how we think about it. So we don't think about it from, yeah, this is our game, um, this is the brand game. So yeah. we just want to build something that is amazing for the audience, that is spot on target audience. Yeah, yeah, I kind of want to build on that because that's one of the most critical thing as we're thinking about, as any brand, thinking about stepping into gaming spaces is what are, what are the users doing? W how can I harness something that is very organic to the platform instead of just trying to force something that we are used to or even just a game mode? And I think it's even a, a bigger challenge as we're thinking about uh, any sports because you have the foundation of a game. So you might want to try and push that in, but instead of doing that, I think thinking about um, how can I provide on connected spaces, additional platforms uh, and celebrate what users are already doing, right? Yeah. Celebrate user generated content and all of the customization option yeah. that really is the, the new platform for those users. Yeah, hundred percent. I, I totally agree. I think the the opportunity for the game developers, um, as an example, we work with with EA, obviously through through Madden. Uh, we have great insight in terms of what's coming in that game from a from a new innovation perspective, and I think for uh, the the different games that are out there for, with brands, that's really the opportunity is to give them more insight in terms of what the roadmap looks like. So you're not building something for six months to a year, and then you get into it. And all of a sudden, things change in the world, in the gaming world, and all of a sudden, what you spent that six months doing isn't as relevant or isn't as powerful as it, as it could be. I, I also 100% agree, first of all, but I, I also think what's different now compared to before is that the world is changing, the gaming industry is changing. Now you can actually do a lot of iterations. You can speak with the community, you can have them co-create the actual game. You can uh, listen to what they're doing and also see what they're doing and then you change it accordingly. And yeah. I think that's a big difference. The, you're, you're almost curating that experience. Um, on, on that topic of curated experiences, um, this past season you guys partnered with Nickelodeon. And again, I rewind, like little kid myself watching, you know, Double Dare <laughs> that, back in the day. Double Dare, that's great. <laughs> a nice little Double Dare reference. Um, look at all Double Dare fans in the back, I hear it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> nice. 
Shout out to Double Dare. Um, but when you go and you add uh, a Nickelodeon a real, you know, near real time experience on top of a very traditional broadcast that's tried and tested and true and the biggest thing ever, like, A, congrats, but B, like, what was that like? How, how did you get through the NFL, one of the most important, like, 18 billion revenue? Like, how do you navigate getting a Nickelodeon broadcast yeah, live uh, and up and running? Yeah, so big, big credit to, to uh, Paramount and our, and our partners at Nickelodeon. Uh, they, they came to us. Uh, with the idea and, and our, our business development team and, and our marketing team as a whole really leaned into it. And it wasn't something that we saw as gonna, it's going to be a, a pull away from our, our main game on, on CBS. It was a, a great way, especially on This Was Christmas last year, to engage younger fans when they're opening their presents on Christmas morning to then watch a football game in, in, a, in a world that's really meant for them. Yeah. And to see just the, the overall engagement, it was the highest rated Nickelodeon program <laughs> yeah. of the year. Yeah. Um, and, and also just anecdotally, to see friends of mine who have kids that are six years old, five years old, texting me and, and showing me their kids locked in on a football game for really the, maybe the first time. Yeah. It shows you what's possible. And, and another, another great example of that is with Toy Story yeah. and, and what we did with Pixar and Disney. And again, that's a just really tight collaboration and, and understanding what's important to our partners that one. at Disney or, in this case, uh, with Nickelodeon. Yeah, I mean, so we're talking about video game lore. We're talking about Toy Story. There's heroes. There's um, protagonists. Um, one thing we've been talking a lot about internally is, like, w the success of the NFL and the consistent growth. Because, I mean, full transparency, it always hasn't been rocket ship growth, right? There's a switch that's been flipped. And it's really around the, what we'll call superheroes. So like, rather than you answer this question, Marcus, talk to us about superheroes and how do you think NFL can go and power uh, an experience with superheroes? No, but I think, first of all, the NFL players, they are superheroes already for a lot of play or a lot of people around the globe. And um, now with the global audience growing for you as well, uh, I think a lot of people are getting start to get to know these people and start to kind of follow them. And um, I think gaming gives a possibility for uh, the players to kind of connect with them in a way. They can uh, buy their type of clothing on their avatar. They can uh, do their kind of uh, goal tricks or whatever. And so I think people are going to look up to superheroes. And more importantly now, when fewer and fewer people are starting to play sports. I think it's uh, 1% uh, fewer for every year in the US uh, per year in the last five years. I think this is super interesting to bring in sports to their eyes, to get them interested, to kind of get them. I think a lot of people, when they come in, then they start to see these kind of superheroes doing really cool things. They want to do the same thing. Yeah, totally. And <laughs> Maggie, yeah. talk, talk, we, we have a really cool case study. Talk, talk about that. Yeah, um, we've, we've been seeing a lot of that happen in the space. Uh, I think one of the most notable initiatives that happened was when Nike Land decided to partner up with LeBron James and uh, do a meet and greet within the space. And they allowed every single user to walk up to the LeBron James avatar and have their own experience. Uh, and that resonated really well with the community because not only were they able to interact with their icon, which I think to Marcus' point, it's really great that um, they are heroes and they don't have to be relatable for the users, but they want to make it approachable in the sense that you don't get to have that experience in real life. You know, for some of those super fun, you don't get to travel to a game to actually even see them from afar, yeah. so let alone have that one-on-one -on -one conversation. So it's been really great to see that brands and athletes and um, celebrities are actually exploring the space in a way that is uh, more human and personal. And in our case, uh, just to build on that, um, what's very cool and, and makes it a little easier for us in the gaming space is that the players are typically in their early 20s, mid 20s, and many of them also have, have kids. So if you think about that dynamic, they they are gamers. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. So they they are very very interested in working with gaming companies. They understand those worlds very well, and they want to lean in. So from our, our perspective, it, it's a natural part of our strategy, connected to the player storytelling that we can we can offer. Yeah. When you start thinking about 
like how you're marketing. And again, we've seen some supernovas in the past few years, obviously Travis Kelsey, Taylor Swift, like supernova, right? Like new games on platforms, like supernovas. You see these big, huge things happen. How do you rally that? Like you, I mean, you, well, there's, there's rumors that you script we, we, this. We didn't set up. We what didn't are your set writers Travis like? And, what are your writers and, like, Ian? <laughs> <laughs> how do you go through and capitalize on something like that so quick? Like similar to the Nickelodeon thing. Like how do you capitalize on that as a as a big organization? Yeah, I think the when the commissioner is constantly pushing us, it, it's not to get complacent. Um, our our playbook should not look the same year over year. Um, and you could you could probably see how that would be relatively easy to fall into that just given the 10-year the deals that we have with our different partners and so on and so forth. But there, there is so much opportunity, uh, and that's the most exciting thing. It's a 100-year-old sports league, but there's opportunity all over the place uh, with partners like, like Roblox, um, like Dentsu, that we can actually do some incredible work that's, that's de definitely innovative, but speaking to that younger ge generation on their terms. In terms of how it works in the development cycles, we, it's a combination of both long lead strategy and business planning, yeah. but then also being nimble enough to take advantage of these opportunities as they arise. And, and I think we've done a pretty good job at that. And the Taylor and, and Travis Kelsey phenomenon is, is one of those where, I mean, you literally, you find out that something like this is kind of brewing and within a couple of hours, you're lighting up the ecosystem. Do you just call her Taylor? Is that your... No, she's, she's uh, Miss Swift yeah. for, for all of us, I think. She's, uh, don't tell her. <laughs> she's here. She's in the back back. Yeah, there yeah. you go. Everyone's looking at it. Um, we, what's funny is um, we talk about capturing those moments. I used to work on the FIFA business, and there's a player. Uh, his name's Diego Jata, if anyone's a Liverpool fan, Portugal fan. Um, he is so good at playing video games. You talk about this younger generation of athlete. plays video games all the time. He, he actually qualified for one of our eSports tournaments, and then we had to disqualify him because he had to go to a Champions League match. And then he scored in the first minute and went and ran and scored and sat down in the corner. <laughs> That's so amazing. And then the team at EA back in Vancouver went and captured that in the Motion Lab and put that into the game, and it was less than 24 hours and so, so i think great. just when you look at like brands being able to capitalize and go and bring those things into motion i i love the analogy of video games being social media and like the new concept of social connectedness because it's it's really a platform and however you toggle that is you know is what the, what the job is really um, we, we, yeah. we did that on uh, Fortnite as well yeah. we built together with wimbledon a uh, race to wimbledon of a school Oh, yeah, yeah, And um, then we had Sir and the Murray. So we put up um, on Wimbledon last year. Uh, you could actually stand and play the game on the premises. <laughs> and then um, we had Sir and the Murray playing the game. And then your goal was to beat him. But it was oh, absolutely so awful at playing the game. <laughs> <laughs> we Everyone beat him. Yeah. <laughs> and we've actually heard, I mean, if you were to speak to Lamar Jackson, who's obviously an incredible quarterback, yeah. MVP, yeah. Uh, he'll tell you that one of the ways he learned football was through Madden. Yeah. Uh, so I think for us, there's also this opportunity to continue to educate fans around the world on what football is, and not only tackle football, but flag football as well, uh, where it, they don't actually have to play necessarily to understand the, the rules and understand the basic fundamentals. Uh, so, so good. Um, so we're getting, we're getting the flashing uh, light in the back of the room. Um, but I did want to try and open up. We've got some great uh, folks in the audience. Um, does anybody have any quick, quick hitting questions for anyone up here? If not, we can, oh, in the back. If this is about Taylor Swift, you can hand, put the hand so when, when is Taylor Swift? Oh, jeez. <laughs> Thank you all for your panel. Um, I'm just curious, uh, when we were talking about fandom and communities, where you see diversity playing a role in both the development of the gaming, you know, involving communities in the development of the gaming. Just your thoughts on that. That's a great question. Yeah, I can take that. Um, we've been, well, especially in connected spaces, it, it's a great question because we've been seeing a lot of customization option. And I think this is at the heart of most of what video game platforms is today. Uh, when you look at the stats on younger generation, you see that over 88% of Gen Z say that they feel more comfortable expressing themselves in connected spaces than they do in real life. That helps build confidence and that helps them truly express their unique sense of self. And so we've been seeing a lot of 
effort being uh, put around that to help give the community more tools and more ways to truly express who they are, no matter where they're from, no matter what their affinity is. And so, yeah, gaming is a great platform for that, for sure. Yeah, and also you have um, almost 50-50% split between uh, male and female on Roblox, for example, uh, all over the world. So you have 48% females, 52% uh, male. So whenever we create something, we don't think about this is a male sport or this is a female sport or this is a male game. Some are going to be more skewed toward that regardless. But we always start to think or try to think about how can we include everyone? How can we also bring in people from every gender and also from all over the world to kind of feel part of it? Because you want to grow the audience. Yeah, 100%. And from, from the league perspective, going even beyond gaming, it is fundamental. Um, it is such a core uh, component of, of what we talk about every single day inside the NFL in terms of who, what our internal pra hiring practices are to what we're looking at from a player perspective. 80% of our players are, are multicultural players, so there's great opportunities for them to continue to build their voices and express their, their stories from their communities. And then we're really looking at growing our fan base through multicultural audiences as well. Uh, so that's been fundamental for us and something we're going to continue to lean into. Awesome. Great question. Great panel, uh, thank you so much. Just a question about, um, you know, thinking about the future of society and how video games can play a role for good. Um, so obviously you're creating a lot of great habits and people are connecting, but how do you all think about, um, you know, making more impact in, into those communities, encouraging more sustainable behaviors maybe? I love that question. Um, I think that because use cases are expanding across connected world and because we've, we've been seeing a lot more representation or echo of in real life events happening into the digital space, um, there is much more effort that's being done around let's make sure that we're representing and capturing um, any and every big event that's happening within those worlds but also how can we provide the tool set for that, again, younger generation who's uh, evolving mainly almost in those spaces um, to allow them to understand the value of sustainability, the value of connectivity um, and be mindful about all of that. So w there is a ton more experiences, especially again on Roblox and because it's a little bit younger in fashion, it really is a great place to you know, start providing that content and, you know, just being able to speak to them again where they are. Yeah, and I think it's a super important question, first of all. Um, there are so many Gen C, Gen Alpha that feel bad today <laughs> around the world. And um, we're involved actually together with Dentsu and Ad Council in a project right now to uh, create awareness about uh, health and uh, young health, and also try to uh, kind of give them tools to empower themselves. And uh, I think it's a great to be in a position where you can actually do help people. Uh, so you, have, you can reach almost every single young person around the world. <laughs> and um, that I really love, and that I feel strongly for myself. Yeah, and, and again, from a league perspective, uh, you know, I think similar to gaming, it's all about community building. And whether it's in a social media environment where it can get really toxic, or in a gaming space, our goal, and where I feel really good about the direction that we're heading, is that it really is about making really healthy communities where fans can connect. And if you look at an NFL game as an example, whether you're a Republican, you're a Democrat, whatever age you are, it doesn't matter. You can go to an NFL game and celebrate your favorite team with whoever you're next to. So at the, at the root of it, football and, and sports really should be a unifier and something that really builds character uh, with, uh, with all fans and with particularly young fans. Yeah, maybe to tie both of those questions together just real quick as leaders, as most people here are, like we're all doing, we're all in entertainment, we're all in, in marketing and there's a lot of stuff that takes place in front of a camera and I think we focus on that a lot, but oftentimes it's what's behind the camera 
that can actually be as equally as important. And, you know, we heard yesterday on the, you know, diversity panel on Gia Peppers in the podcast, like, it's so critical that your staff is diverse to get diverse output. So it's like that behind the camera is just so much more important. I mean, you employ 200 people. You're part of a thousand person. We're part of a 70,000 person organization. We're all hiring people. Like it goes down to the, the fundamentals as well. And I think gaming community generally is very vocal. We're always right. <laughs> and like we're, we have the channels and, and the output to go and do that. And so as like decision makers, it's important to go and, and, and have that diversity. And that's not just gender diversity. Um, neurodiversity, to your point, I think is a huge one. And there's a lot of issues with that in, in video games. And not issues, even opportunities. Um, and really strong communities. I think you guys have done a really good job with that as well. So um, We good we one. actually been thinking about it. We're a young company, four years old. And we have 220 people or approximately. Um, but I think we have over 30 nationalities. And um, we have... Uh, try to have 50 50 split male female but it's very difficult in the gaming industry <laughs> so i have 30 percent approximately it's hard and that's high that's very high for a uh, developer in europe so it's it is very high yeah kudos um awesome that's all we have i really appreciate everyone coming out thank you so much to the panelists thank you thank you everyone thank uh, you have a good rest of the show yeah